and thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Christine, I'm from the Danish Meteorological Institute. I have a PhD in oceanography. Uh, I'm perhaps more of a physicist than, than rabbit horse. Um, and my main working areas are ocean modeling, uh, especially the physical part, in, including uh, sea level forecasting. Also, I'm working with coastal altimetry, that is measure, measuring uh, sea surface height from satellites. And uh, I have some uh, tasks within future sea level rise as well. Uh, today I'm going to talk about where do the in input data for, uh, for uh, storm search modeling come from, who does the modeling, um, how, do we, uh, how do, does the forecaster uh, judge and decide when to send out warnings, um, how are these warnings communicated, and um, how, are they, how do we best get them out into the public. So... Um, by the end of the lesson, you should have an overview of the general principles of storm search forecasting, and especially how we do it at the Danish Meteorological Institute. And uh, I will put a little bit of global perspective in there. So I will focus on the, the Danish Meteorological uh, Institute way of doing it. Um, so to, uh, to get a storm search forecast, you need to start out with some uh, input data to your, your model. Um, you need atmospheric data uh, input, and that will come from a, a, a numerical weather prediction. Um, you need wind and pressure, and in most cases you'll also need temperature and uh, perhaps some other parameters. Um, then you need some good boundary conditions, uh, because most likely you'll be working on a regional domain. So on the boundary you'll need uh, some tides. But you'll also need uh, some uh, search component if a search can come from the outside of your domain and, and travel into it. And then you'll probably need temperature and salinity on the boundary as well, maybe velocities. Um, then it's a good thing to have some observations in your area as well. That could be, be from tide gauges, that's a station most likely on land that measures the sea level height. Um, but it could also come from satellites. You, all, you put all of that into your storm search model, and we'll hear much more about storm search models uh, later in the course, so I won't spend too much time on the technical details of, of what that is. Um, I will present a little bit about it, though. Um, and the storm search model output is presented to the forecaster which again communicate all this uh, information to uh, authorities, to media, and to the general public. So um, at the Danish Meteorological Institute, we use meteorological forcing from the uh, European Center for uh, Medium Range Weather Forecasts. They have a global model, and we downscale that with our own atmospheric model. Um, for the Danish, uh, Denmark is here, and we are right here now. Um, so we have a model covering this area out to Iceland and uh, a bit of the North East Atlantic. Uh, we also have a model for, for Greenland, since that's also a part of the Danish Kingdom. Um, so we have a special model for, for that, but I'm not going to talk about Greenland today. This is our model domain. So um, this is actually the area where we have uh, our main model, our 3D model. So it goes, uh, stops here at, at the British coast and uh, up here between Scotland and Norway. And it does not cover Ireland. Ireland. Um, but we do have a, a 2D model covering the North Atlantic to give us this search component that we need on the boundary. So here on the boundary we have tides and we have the search component coming in from, from the 2D model. We also have a temperature and salinity from climatology. And then we have uh, rivers coming in. I just put in a few errors uh, uh, here, and I think there are actually about 50-something uh, rivers in our model. We also have a lot of in, uh, observations in the area. Um, the North Sea and the Baltic Sea is an area with a long tradition of uh, storm search um, 
storm surge uh, measuring and storm surge prediction. And that also me means that we have a dense network of tight gauges. We also have international cooperation. I don't know how many of you, most are European, so you'll know how many countries are actually here. But just to, to mark, Denmark is here, Sweden, Finland, and then we have the three Baltic countries, Poland down here, Russia here, and Germany down here. So it's actually many different countries working together to make a, a network like this. But it's all organized in, in the Goose Corporation and the News Corporation, and there are also e, EU projects like uh, MyOcean that uh, coordinates a lot of work. Um, so we have uh, a network of tide gauges around our area, um, and these uh, data are exchanged in, in real time. But if we look to, to Denmark, we actually have a tide gauge in almost every harbor. Just, I mean, Denmark is 400 kilometers long, so this is a lot of tide gauges. Um, that all, all comes in in real time to the Met office, and it's used in in the in the tight, uh, in the storm surge prediction system, and then there's uh, data for assimilation. You could assimilate tight gauges. We, uh, the Dutch are doing that, and uh, that will be pre presented here. But you could also use uh, satellite altimetry. Okay, if if you have to go home and uh, and start your own uh, storm surge modeling, um, this. Uh, uh, availability of, of met forcing is obviously an important question, and uh, the met forcing that is available to you uh, depends on, on your situation, your organization. Um, many places in Europe will have uh, the European Center data available, um, but it's not open access to everybody. So another uh, possibility would be to use. Uh, the NSEP global model, that's the American model, and it's freely avail uh, available, also the forecast and the data. Um, I just went into the web page and it took me half an hour to get this out, get the data file out, get it plotted and see what's actually in there. So that's, um, that's easy. If you're to go out and start your own, um, get your boundary conditions ready uh, for your model, there are global, global solutions. I would like to highlight one, which happened to be uh, from my colleague at the Danish, De Danish Technical University, um, Ole B. Janassen. He has made a global model um, that is good in coastal areas, which is most likely to be the case when you do storm surge modeling. So that's, uh, that's out there, there and it's available. Then there are observations. Um, there are a number of global observations around the world. I just took a quick example from uh, Ca Castle's town end here in Ireland, and I don't know much about the location. Mon many of you probably know more about it, but it's just to illustrate what is actually available and what's not available. So uh, this is the time series that is available from, from uh, the Glass Fast database. And you see it goes back to uh, this is 2006 here. So there, there are some years of data, but it does not go up to all the way to today, although it's supposed to be, be uh, in, in uh, near real time. So uh, there is a lack of data in, in recent years. But it just took out one year of data just to see what's in there. And you see there, there's a big tidal signal at the station. I took out the tides, and the, that leaves the, the red line here. And um, then I took out two, uh, two events. That happens to be uh, one in August and one in, in uh, October, where we actually see that in August we have, we have a surge here, but it's in a period with neat tides. So the, the total water level signal is, is not very big. While as here in October, the surge component is, is perhaps not much bigger than up here, but it comes in a period with, uh, with spring tides, so, so this, the total signal is actually quite a big larger. So that just so shows the effect of, of how uh, the, uh, the surge component and the tide component work together, and sometimes they will, uh, they will in, uh, come on top of each other, and sometimes they will, they will uh, rule out, out each other. Then we have the uh, 
the model system. Um, so this is actually uh, showing the bathymetry with the, the deep Norwegian trench coming in here, the high resolution area and down here. As I said, uh, we use a model called HPM, which has been developed in Germany and the Danish Meteorological Institute. And it's not open access, but uh, you could use uh, ROMs or, or HICOM. That would both uh, be feasible, and that's uh, community models. Um, there is also a big uh, movement towards using NEMO, but we have not seen that successfully fully used in, in the Baltic Sea yet. And there's a lot of work towards using that in the North Sea. Um, so there are different, many different models out there. Um, we use uh, two nested models, as I said, quite high resolution spatially, and also we have uh, 52 vertical layers. Um, and I think one thing that we need to work on in, in the future is that we still have a surface layer of, of eight meters out in the North Sea because uh, uh, we don't want it to dry out. Um, so that's something that we need to work on. Um, we also put in, uh, we have a fjord here that is actually connecting both from the North Sea and, and from this uh, more protected site in here from Kattegat. So we put in a high resolution, uh, 400 meter resolution model of this fjord in particular uh, because we have some storm surge situations with water coming in here and flooding these areas that are quite sensitive to flooding. Um, and that's not two way nested, it's just one way. Okay, so what do we actually want to forecast? Um, when we have the sea level, we want to forecast what is going to be the highest level. That's quite obvious. But we also want to ex uh, find out when we exceed the uh, critical level that we have defined pre-hand and when we go back to normal. So these are, these are sort of uh, three different times and a level. And our main uh, measure of how good the model is, is our peak error. So that's uh, when we have a forecast, how, how good are we at predicting the, the peak of the event. Uh, not so much this level here, but, but this level here. Um, so not, uh, there can be both a, a, an error in the timing and in the, in the absolute value of the peak. Okay, so uh, how do we actually develop our storm search model? Um, we go through a, a loop uh, that, uh, for the DMI case, it, it, uh, uh, we send out new model version a couple of times a year and we have user meetings uh, every two years. Um, so we, we have a cycle of model uh, development and testing and then we make it operational and then we have user feedback that gives us, us a new loop of, of model development. And just one example of this, um, uh, the sound between Denmark and Sweden, that's quite a narrow place, we'll see a map in just a second. Um, here we had a high sea level event in uh, 2011 where we have some, this, the red one is the observation, so we had two different peaks at Copenhagen and our storm search model only predicted one peak, the other one was not quite uh, found in the model. Um, this was a, a user feedback that showed that we needed some, some model development. Um, so we, we uh, went into a deep analysis of the model. So this is Copenhagen here, and this is the Swedish coast. And this is uh, just, uh, I think there are 10 kilometers across here. So it's, it's quite a narrow strait, and it's uh, quite deep up here, and only uh, eight meters deep down here. So there's a lot of, of bathymetry, there's a lot of uh, dynamics in this area. And actually we have, uh, there was an observed sea level gradient from here to here of 2.5 meters. That was not quite in the model. And that's probably why we didn't see the two peaks. So uh, our development group uh, made some work on the bathymetry and on the bottom friction in this particular area. And uh, they made sure that uh, it would correct the local error but that it did not make the model worse in other areas and in other situations. And they actually succeeded in this, so, so uh, now the colors changed a bit, so now we have the observations in blue and the old model in red, but the new model in green. So you see that the new model actually comes up to here and catches this, 
the second peak, so that was quite good. Um, so, um, just on uh, operational model execution, we had these uh, uh, five Coke machines, f six Coke machines in, in the basement. Um, they do not sell Coke, uh, they, they uh, do quite a few computations. Um, so that's our, our uh, main uh, workforce, that's a big computer. The team I'm a part of is, is sort of the non-operational staff, and we, uh, we develop and test the model. We uh, also prepare it for, for the operationalization, <laughs> thank you, uh, including a good manual. And so we're sort of the experts on how the ocean works and, and how the observational system is all in place. Then we have an IT staff, which is on 24-7, and they secure a safe uh, execution of the model, and it can, they can also handle a breakdown, uh, let's say that the weather forecast is delayed, so the, the ocean model will not work, well then they can say, okay, we wait a few hours until the, the weather model is in place and we can restart the model. Um, if there is something more seriously wrong with the, with the computer, we had a flooding of the basement, so the cooling system did not work for the computer. Um, then uh, some IT experts are called in and, uh, and they can handle these, these sorts of issues. Uh, but I'm, as an ocean expert, is not on call. So if there's something really wrong with the with the ocean model, actually a small country like Denmark will just say, well, then you have to look to the Swedish forecast. Um, for the um, then we have the operational weather service. So there are no ocean experts looking at the output, but the, the weather service people have been trained at looking at the output, and that works quite well. Um, they can uh, analyze the output, they can issue warnings, and uh, uh, they can uh, perform uh, search and rescue or oil spill simulations based on, on the fo uh, forecast data. So. Um, for a small country like Denmark, that means that we do not need um, an ocean uh, forecaster on, on duty all 24-7. So we just have the weather service taking care of this part. And, and I think for, for Denmark, uh, during night time, there are three or four people at work taking care of both the weather and the ocean. So that can save some, some resources. Then back to uh, this uh, question of, uh, of how do we see uh, if the model is okay. Um, actually, for, for Denmark, the, the answer is that we look to our neighbors. So uh, we have um, this system with the tight gauges and the, the um, cooperation with the neighboring countries. Um, we also have that for, for the forecasts. So here we have uh, the, the German model, model in green and uh, two different uh, Danish models in, in black and orange, and the Swedish model in blue, and another Swedish model also in blue, and a third gray uh, Swedish model, and then we have the observations in red, and we have these four selected stations around Denmark. So we actually see the different forecasts from the different countries, and that's of course, uh, that gives uh, integrated uh, uh, uncertainty esti um, uh, estimate of both, uh, both the weather, effect, uh, weather prediction effect and, and the model differences. So this is just the, uh, the other version that uh, you can also have an example of, of weather forecasts and predict your model and in that way have a suite of, of um, uh, uh, atmospheric conditions forcing your model and giving a suite of output that you can use for an uncertainty estimate of your actual forecast. And this comes from, from one ocean model. So I will just uh, move on to, uh, to a small thing. Uh, the Dutch are actually assimilating um, uh, the uh, sea level observations. We do not that do that in, in Denmark. Instead, we take our uh, unassimilated model and adjust it to the observations. So we have uh, this black here is our forecast, and this is our observed sea level, and this is our most recent observation. And we simple, simply move the forecast up to fit the observations. Um, and that's uh, quick.
quick and dirty solution, you could say, but it actually works quite well in, in reality. Um, unfortunately, of course, only in locations where you have tight gauges. Um, but as you saw before, we have tight gauges in all the harbors, so um, that works out for, for a country like Denmark. Um, this is uh, how the, the data is presented to the forecaster. So they have a map of Denmark with, you cannot see the numbers, but they are there, all the different numbers from the different harbors. And they can click on individual uh, stations and get uh, the observations, um, the model and the adjusted model for, for each station. They can also get the numbers out and see exactly when, when the, the critical level is, is exceeded. Um, then they have some uh, criteria for warnings that are prefixed, um, and there are some general levels for, for regions of Denmark, um, like if the water goes above uh, 1.9 meters in the northern Denmark, then, uh, then uh, a warning will be sent out. And warnings are sent out uh, 24 hours in advance. Uh, with a modern system, we could actually do that uh, sooner, but uh, or further in advance. But that's how the uh, the authorities are used to having it. Um, then, for for in case of a big uh, storm surge, we have, I guess you could say, two different ways of, of handling it. Um, in Denmark, we have what we call sector responsibility. That means that in an extreme situation, uh, it continues to be DMI that does uh, the forecasting and the uh, uh, the communication to other authorities. We do not have a switch of authorities. But in other countries, the, the, the responsibility might change. So that's uh, quite important also to realize in, in your own country, how is this system actually working? And it's different from country to country. So um, we also already had some discussion, and I think we're also spending quite a bit of the time. But are there any quick questions on, on this or other comments? Okay, and I'll just move on. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, this critical level. Uh, the critical level? Yes. Yeah, I imagine that critical level could be uh, the maximum level that uh, the sea the level of the earth uh, Yes, we have we have the coastal authorities of Denmark. They can collect the tide gauge information back in time and make statistics of what a 20-year storm surge is and a 100-year event, and and you can put the critical level at. Um, actually, I'm not sure what the level is. I think it's about a one-year event that they are interested in. And this is based on the total level. Let's say if you have big storm surge but not high level, because this is of no time. Oh, this is the total signal that we're looking at. So it's a combination of, su of uh, search and tide. We, al we, already, uh, we always look at the combined signal. And our model also has both things in it. Okay, so then we move on to communication. And um, in, in Denmark we have... Uh, uh, three levels of, of uh, authorities. We have state authorities, regional authorities, which are not so big anymore, they used to be. And then we have uh, local authorities, and they are informed uh, by fax or by phone um, for uh, 24 hours in advance, or for small events, only 18 hours in advance. And then uh, seven hours before uh, the critical level is exceeded, we go into a loop where they are updated every hour with new forecasts. And uh, we also inform media in these cases, um, and uh, they're informed by phone uh, directly to the journalist or by press releases. Um, when we want to uh, communicate to the general, general public, we have our, uh, our homepage where you can go and click and see, see the water level right now. And that, goes, that works both in, in normal situations and in stop search situations. And you see this, uh, this um, um, observations and then the, the prognosis or the forecast that is, is fitted to the observations. So in, um, 
in warning situations. We also get a map that is, uh, uh, you see that on the front of our, our uh, uh, the Danish Meteorological Institute webpage. And right now, uh, the map is only split into, uh, uh, I think there are five dif different regions here of Denmark, but in the spring we'll update it to have uh, uh, almost 100 uh, areas. And we can highlight with the yellow, orange or red how big the risk is. And in a typical storm surge situation, there might both be a risk for extreme winds and for storm surge and uh, maybe for, for waves, and that have, has different maps. So you can easily see how, uh, how big a risk there is in, in your area. This was sort of a boring day to show. There was no signal, so, uh, but uh, they, they will show up. Um, <coughs> Then uh, we have, uh, I have a quick example here of, of this uh, body storm search that I talked about earlier. Um, the, it was a st uh, quite a big uh, storm that hit on uh, December 5th of last year. And um, we had a storm search that hit the Danish west coast at the same time as, as the extreme wind. And that's quite a usual situation for us. It was a rather big storm search, but it was something that the authorities and, and the general public was used to get information about. Um, but then actually the day later, the water had come into to the Kattegat area and really accum accumulated on the on the Danish uh, on this island here, Copenhagen is right here, and there are quite a few people living in this area here. Maybe you see that there is a fjord here. There is a fjord here, and we have only been doing uh, tight gauge measurements there for 20 years. So our statistics for this exceedance level is not very good. Our model is certainly not validated for this fjord, and the model resolution, even though it's high, it's quite coarse for this uh, this fjord. So all in a sudden, we had our model saying three day days in advance. It's going to be two meters in the town of Roskilde, which is probably the town of Cork, uh, size of the town of Cork. We are going to have a thousand year event based on 20 years of statistics. We do have an error in our model out on an island. Um, how is, is this a good forecast or is it, isn't it? Then it was quite nice to, go, to be able to go to our Swedish colleagues and they, they do not do the same modeling of the fjord, but at least they have a point up here where we could compare the forecast just outside the fjord and see, okay, they actually have the high forecast, the Germans have the high forecast. We go out and say, this is going to be a thousand year event. And um, we didn't quite dare to say it um, the day before. This is a lot of text in Danish. Um, we said that uh, in the fjord it's going to be between 1.4 and 1.8 meters. That was what we said the morning before. Um, even though we had a forecast saying it's going to be 2 meters because we didn't quite trust it. But uh, then we had this uh, loop of iterations going forward and we could see that the, the sea level was actually rising so we ended up actually uh, sending out warnings about this 2 meter uh, value which was completely right. It ended up. So, um, yeah. Um, and this was how the harbor looked on, on the Danish on the north coast of the island. So this was not even inside the fjord. Um, there was quite a bit of flooding of, of a town inside the fjord. So it was good that we had sent out the warning. Nobody. I, there was one person going out on a road on a dike that was flooded, and that person was killed. But nobody else was. So then there's communication uptake. I'm not going to speak so much about that, but how do we communicate well on this? And I went down to our communication department and they said that, um, well, one thing is there's so much focus on the storm that uh, the media often forget to, to talk about the storm search, at least after, until after the main storm has been there. Um, and then also the media get tired of writing the same stories again and again and hearing about the event again and again. So when we start to send out a lot of press information about the storm and then later come with a storm search uh, message, well, they don't really bother. It's not new anymore. Um, also, they said it's easy to re uh, reach the group that know they are at risk, but uh, in a case like the one, uh, the uh, Bodil storm that I just talked about, um, we had to go out and reach a whole new group. They had they had not seen a storm like that in a thousand years. 
So uh, you had to go out and communicate to a group that, that did know, not know that they are at risk. And I had to, uh, we had to make them aware that they were risk, at risk in time for them to prepare for it. And actually, even though uh, uh, this, uh, the storm built over, up over several hours, um, it does take time to, to react to this. Afterwards, we were sitting back looking at that picture from the harbor saying, these boat owners, they could actually have sailed their boat to the Copenhagen Harbor instead. It's just 50 kilometers. They could have done that the two days before when our forecast was, uh, the first forecast was ready. Um, we do not yet have, have a system that take up this information, send it out to the boat owners and make them move their boat. So uh, maybe that's something to look at the, in the future. Um, our communication department is very happy about social media, such as, as Twitter. So they're trying to work on this and um, uh, trying to reach a whole new group of people through that. Um, but just to uh, summarize, uh, we need high quality uh, um, input to our forecasts if they're going to be good. That's kind of, kind of obvious. Um, we also need oceanographers with local knowledge to be able to improve the model. And we need to have resources to learn from the past. That's actually a bit of bigger issue than you should think it was. Um, operation